Okay, let's go to the fifth seal. Revelation 6, verse 9 starts off, When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. Now to the first century uh, Christian church, they would, re they would recognize under the altar, this is where the Levitical priests were instructed to pour out the excess blood of the sacrifices. Uh, and then, of course, the blood being the life of the creature that's being sacrificed. So this is not all that foreign to them. But notice, these are the souls of those who have been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. These people are not casualties due to events associated with the Great Tribulation uh, that's being in, unleashed by the four horsemen. So in other words, like if there's incoming missiles and it takes these people out, that's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about, that these people are instead, they're martyrs. They're martyrs for Christ. They have been slain because of their testimony of the gospel, enraging the Antichrist and his forces and being, shall we say, chopped off of their heads. Uh, the Greek word uh, uh, for the, uh, they had born is echo and it means to have or to hold fast as an object of knowledge, of faith or practice. So in other words, they're unyielding. They choose Christ over man. They choose to obey God rather than man. So this tells us that the church plays a valuable role. The saints play a valuable role of reaching out to the lost, preaching the gospel during the tribulation. Stop and think about it. There's a lot going on. People are really getting nervous. They're getting scared. They're getting shaken. And those whose hearts are trying to figure out what's right and what's wrong in all this, and they want to seek the truth. They're, they, they say, oh my God, that's it? My God, I need to come to you? How do I do this? Guess what? There will be saints there to help them, to show them the way to eternal life. So vitally important. This is gonna be the church's finest hours, guys. Um, where we can shine as a church. Let's read on the verse 10. They, being the martyrs, they're before the throne. They cried out in a loud voice. O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on earth? Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete, who were to be killed as they themselves had been. Wow. Once again, this leaves no wiggle room, no shadow of a doubt. This is applying to believers, more specifically to martyred believers. Another interesting thing here is that these saints that have died and gone up to heaven and before their throne, guess what? They still remember what went on before they went up there. There's a level of consciousness after death because they know that uh, what had happened to them and they knew that God would judge and avenge those that killed them. They're asking God to avenge their deaths on those who dwelt on the earth. Lord, those down below, those that have chopped off our heads, those that have come against us, Lord, Please avenge our death. They know this is the result of the Antichrist persecution, the Antichrist tribulation. They know this is not God's wrath. God's wrath has not been poured out yet. Okay? And what is the answer that God told them? They're told to rest a little longer until, okay, until God's wrath. God is withholding his wrath until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete. So he's waiting until the fullness of the Gentiles are complete. Who are to be killed? 
as they themselves had been, meaning that down below, Antichrist still has the authority. He's still being allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. And authority was given it, that being the beast, over every tribe and people and language and nation. So, having said that, the martyrdom that we're to expect in end times, let's take another uh, closer look at it. Revelations 20, verse 4. Then I saw thrones and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. Also, I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded, beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God. Jesus had warned us in John 16, verse one. He says, I have said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. This is vitally important that we have our hearts and minds and soul prepared for such a tribulation to keep us from falling away. Then he goes on and says, they will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering a service to God. Huh? You mean they don't think they're following Satan? They think they're following God. That's what Jesus Christ is saying. And they will do these things because they have not known the Father nor me. So it's a false religion. But I have said these things to you that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you so that you will be prepared. He says later in the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24, 9, then they will deliver you up to tribulation. And what? He'll put you to death and you will be hated by all nations. Why? For my name's sake. This is specifically addressed to Christians. Um, the Israelis, the Hebrew people, that's almost a given because that's what started this whole thing. But the Christians, those also, Satan and the Antichrist will come against with equal hatred. Revelation 6, 9, when he opened the fifth seal, which we just saw, I saw under the altar the souls of what? Of those who have been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. So this is what the end time martyrdom would look like. So let's kind of distill it down a little. So uh, these end time martyrs are beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God. Uh, whoever kills them uh, will think he is offering service to God. Um, the saints are going to be delivered uh, to tribulation and put to death and will be hated by all nations. Why? For the name's sake of Jesus Christ. And then, of course, those who have been slain were slain because of the word of God and for the witness they had borne. So to put this in more modern terms, end time persecution is going to entail a very extreme anti-Christian and anti-Semitic movement, a movement, a people group that hates the Jews, that hates the Christians. And this persecution is going to entail beheadings, lots and lots and lots of beheadings. Also, this group that's coming against the Christians and the Jews, they believe they are divinely appointed to kill Non-believers, non-believers being those that don't believe the way they believe. And this group, we're, here we're talking, this is a global movement. This is not just Middle East. This is bigger than the Middle East. So it's going to be a global movement because as Jesus Christ says, you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. So with what we've already discussed and explored on who is really the fourth kingdom, who's going to be resurrected as the kingdom of feet and toes, and was it the Romans? Nope, didn't meet the qualification. Was the Islamic caliphate? They met the qualification big time. So let's explore then the Islamic caliphate. 
of the resurrection of the Ottoman Empire. Okay, I think we can say beyond a shadow of a doubt that Islam hates Jews. Not only do they hate Jews, they hate their supporters, which are Christians. Uh, stop and think about it. When you see all these flag burning ceremonies of, of, uh, of uh, radical Muslims on their jihad, they're burning what? Two flags. One is Israel, one is the United States. Uh, sadly, the U.S. flag doesn't represent Christians like it used to. We're more of a post-Christian nation, but it's the Jews and their supporters that they hate. So let's look at the Quran. The Quran says, amongst them, being the Jews, we, Allah, have placed enmity and hatred till the day of judgment. So Allah says, we're to hate the Jews until the day of judgment. Every time they kindle a fire of war, Allah doth extinguish it, but they ever strive to do mischief on earth. They continue to do this. And Allah loveth not those who do mischief. So the Quran is saying Allah hates the Jews. A hateth, a hateth is a, a words of instruction by Muhammad. Um, Muhammad said, the last hour would not come unless the Muslims will fight against the Jews and the Muslims will kill them until the Jews would hide themselves behind a stone or a tree and a stone or a tree would say, Muslim or the servant of Allah, there is a Jew behind me, come and kill him. But the tree, uh, Gorkad, would not say, for it is the tree of the Jews. Here's a quote from an imam of the Palestinian Authority, where he says, the battle with the Jews will surely come. The decisive Muslim victory is coming without a doubt. And the prophet spoke about in more than one hadith, and the day of resurrection will not come without the victory of the believers, that being the Muslims, over the descendants of the monkeys and the pigs, the Jews, and with their annihilation. And then he goes on to say, O oh Allah, accept our martyrs in the highest heavens. O oh Allah, show the Jews a black day. O oh Allah, annihilate the Jews and their supporters. Who are their supporters? Those that stand shoulder to shoulder with the Jewish people, the Judeo-Christians. O oh Allah, raise the flag of jihad across the land. And we've already talked about the black flag and the white flag, remember? And what was the purpose and what was the mission, especially the black flag, to plant the black flag on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem in total victory, total and complete victory. So, is beheading, beheading Islam's preferential way of killing the infidels? Absolutely. So let's look at this a little more closely. Historically, we're going to go back to the days of Muhammad in 627 AD, where Muhammad and his followers, they, uh, then they, that being a Jewish village in Kariza, they surrendered to the Muslims. And the apostle, the apostle here is Muhammad, confined them in Medina. And then the apostle went out to the market of Medina, which is still a market today, and dug trenches in it. And then he sent for them and struck off their heads in those trenches as they were brought out to him in batches. They were 600 or 700 in all, though some put the figures as high as 800 or 900. This went on until the apostle made an end to them. Six, seven, eight, nine hundred. Let's fast forward to 1842, where the Afghani Muslims overtook the British garrison in Kabul, Afghanistan. And what did they do? They beheaded over 2,000 men, women, and children even children. The heads were placed on sticks around the city as decorations. Okay, let's go to a hadith. A uh, hadith, uh, uh, one of them that reads, whoever wishes to be delivered from the fire and enter the garden 
should die with faith in Allah and the last day. And he who swears allegiance to a caliph should give him the pledge of his hand and the sincerity of his heart. So in other words, submit to him both outwardly and inwardly. He should obey him to the best of his capacity. And then read this. If a man comes forward disputing his authority, the caliph's authority, they should behead the latter. So even the Muslims, if there's somebody that uh, in their freedom of speech says, well, I don't necessarily agree with you, Mr. Caliph, off with your head. Let's fast forward to 2004, where there was um, a news, well, just a, a, a yearly uh, progress report in, of uh, government from a moderate, more moderate Islamic nation, that nation being Saudi Arabia. Here's the CBS News. They reported that the Saudi government beheaded 52 men and one woman last year for crimes including murder, homosexuality, that's odd, we don't really hear much about that in mainstream media, armed robbery, uh, armed robbery and drug trafficking. A condemned convict is brought into the courtyard, his hands are tied, forced to bow down before an executioner who swings a huge sword amid cries from the onlookers of Allahu Akbar, Arabic for God is great. The Washington Times also reported this story, and they quoted Sam Hamid, the former director of the Islamic Center, where? In Washington, D.C., commenting on the Islamic beheadings. Quote, if they're going to have an execution, the executioner must say a prayer and ask for forgiveness from God for what he is doing and pray for the person's soul being killed. Now, is that true? We'll discuss that later. He said, you can't do it like the idiots on TV. The right thing to do is to slit the person's throat, not cut off the entire head. So this is our former director of the Islamic Center in Washington, D.C. As far as fast forward a little closer, uh, January 26, 2017, reported by the Christian Daily that Somalians who are suspected, suspected, not really caught in the act of worshiping God, but they're suspected to have converted to Christianity. They're faced with rush public beheadings without a proper trial. And while the Christians in the country experience extreme persecution at the hands of Islamic jihadists, according to an international law analyst for Open Doors International, World Watch Research Unit, we can't even begin, we being the Western nation, being the Western uh, uh, church, we can't even begin to understand the persecution that our fellow brethren in Christ are, are facing in Africa, in the Middle East, in China. Okay, so that's beheading. Okay, we've already talked about hatred of Jews, hatred of Christians, uh, beheading as a preferred means of killing the infidels. Well, what about their perspective on the world? Are they on a global campaign? Well, let's read what the Quran says. For when the sacred months have passed away, then slay the idolaters wherever you find them and take them captive and besiege them and lie in wait for them in every ambush. Then if they repent and keep up in prayer and pay their obligatory charity, Leave their way to free to them. Surely Allah is forgiving, merciful. That's what the Quran says. A couple more verses. If you encounter in war those who disbelieve, you may strike the next. Another verse in the Quran, when ye encounter the infidels, strike off their heads. There's also what's called the law of kisas, which is reciprocity. And it's, it, it goes like this. I asked Ali, what is written in this sheet of paper? And Ali replied, it deals with the diya, which is compensatory blood money paid by the killer to the relatives of the victim. The ransom for releasing the captives from the hands of the enemies and the law 
that no Muslim should be killed in Kisas for the killing of a disbeliever. So in other words, if a Muslim is caught killing, murdering a disbeliever, yeah, that's fine. Nothing here. Move along. A little more on Islam's global campaign. This is uh, Ibn Khaldun. He's an Islamic historian and philosopher of days past. And he says, in the Muslim community, the holy war is a religious duty. Not a suggestion, a religious duty because of the universalism of the Muslim mission and the obligation to convert everybody to Islam either by persuasion or by force. Therefore, the caliphate Spiritual, the royal, that being the governmental, military authority, are united in Islam so that the person in charge can devote the available strength to both of them at the same time. Hmm. How does that apply today? Well, that's, quote, Omar Ahmed, chairman of the board of the Council on American Islamic Relations, the CAIR, that's based in Washington, D.C. Here's his quote. Islam isn't in America to be equal to any other faith, but to become dominant. dominant. That's the only purpose of Islam from a Muslim's point of view. The Quran should be the highest authority in America, and Islam the only accepted religion on earth. So it's not freedom of religion. It's total totalitarian um, occupation of earth, forcing everybody to either accept Islam or off with their heads. Okay, here's one more. This is from a world-renowned scholar. His name is this long, but his last name is Madudi. Okay, so Madudi says the following. Islam is not a normal religion like the other religions in the world, and Muslim nations are not like normal nations. Muslim nations are very special because they have a command from Allah to rule the entire world and to be over every nation in the world. Islam is a revolutionary faith that comes to destroy any government made by man. Islam does not look for a nation to be in a better condition than another nation. Islam doesn't care about the land or who owns the land. The goal of Islam is to rule the entire world and submit all of mankind to the faith of Islam. Any nation or power that gets in the way of that goal, Islam will fight and destroy. In order to fulfill that goal, Islam can use every power available, every way it can be used to bring worldwide revolution. This is jihad. Now, if we put this into the context of the Antichrist, especially what we read about in Daniel chapter 11, what motivated what motivates the Antichrist? What motivates Satan? It's not occupation of land. It's not power. It's not money. It's hatred. Hatred against the Abrahamic covenant. Hatred against God's chosen people. Hatred against God's chosen land. And definitely hatred against Mount Zion. That is what motivates the Antichrist. And I think we see a parallel in a people group in a, in a worldwide religion today. This is jihad. This is jihad. There's actually five types and they're all uh, obligatory to the Muslim. So there's jihad al-nafs, which is striving against one's inner self. There's jihad al-shaitan, which is striving against Satan. There's jihad al-kufar, which is striving against the disbelievers. Then there's jihad al Munhafikin, which is striving against the hypocrites. And then there's Jihad al-Fasikin, 
which is striving against their own, the corrupt Muslims. Here's some quotes. Allah's apostle Muhammad said, quote, I have been ordered to fight the people till they say none has the right to be worshipped but Allah. Another quote, fight those from among the people of the book who believe not in Allah, nor in the last day, nor hold as unlawful what Allah and his messenger have declared to be unlawful, nor follow the true religion until they pay the tax, considering a favor and acknowledge their subjection. That's in the Quran. Here's another verse in the Quran. O ye who believe, fight those of the disbelievers who are near you and let them find harshness in you and know that Allah is with those who keep their duty unto him. This is jihad. Now, what about the caliph? We talked a little bit about the caliph. Let's, let's look a little deeper into him. Uh, first of all, let's look at a hadith, a teaching of Muhammad. Whoever wishes to be delivered from the fire and enter the garden should die with faith in Allah in the last day. He who swears allegiance to a caliph should give him the pledge of his hand and the sincerity of his heart. They need to submit to him both outwardly and inwardly. He should obey him to the best of his capacity. And if a man comes forward disputing his authority, they should behead the latter. Now let's go back to this moderate uh, Islamic nation of Saudi Arabia. This is a Saudi Arabian governmental Department of Islamic Affairs, the IAD. And they're quoted saying, the noble prophet said, quote, it is obligatory upon a Muslim to listen and obey to the authority of the caliph. Whether he likes it or not, he has to obey. One who has already taken an oath of allegiance to one leader, an imam, and has committed his hand and his heart should obey him as much as may be possible for him. If somebody else opposes and contests the authority of that leader, that being the imam, the said opponent should be beheaded. So the caliph, who, who exactly is the caliph? Well, he's seen as the successor of Muhammad and the leader of all Muslims, okay? And there's gonna be one day that there's probably going to be a caliph that's going to claim to be the Mahdi. The Mahdi is the Islamic Messiah. And if this caliph, this Mahdi, Mahdi proclaims that all Christians and Jews and Israelis and any who support them are to be considered enemies of Islam, which uh, there'll be nothing new from Islam. Uh, we are reading about this day in and day out then all Muslims, because it's coming from the caliph, and especially because it's coming from the self-proclaimed Mahdi, would be obligated to make war against these groups. And when ye encounter the infidels, strike off their heads. How does that compare to what we've been reading so far? Matthew 24, 5, for many will come in my name saying, I am the Messiah. Or maybe they'll be saying, I am the Mahdi. And they will lead many astray. Messiah, Messiah, Mahdi, it's all the same. It depends on the people group. Matthew 24, 23, at that time, if someone says to you, look, here's the Messiah, or look, here's the Mahdi, or there he is, don't believe. Okay, there's something else we need to talk about because first and foremost, you know, it's like, okay, Dave, I hear you, but if I go to the source and the source being those that represent Islam, those that are speaking with authority, a Muslim himself, they're not saying this. So who do I believe? Do I believe you or do I believe them? After all, they know much more about Islam than you do, Dave. Yes, very true. But guess what? Let's explore lying in Islam. Because we're going to find out that lying in Islam, there are two instances 
where it is sanctioned, it is promoted, it's encouraged to lie. Not to tell the truth, but to lie. Muslim scholars allow lying for two reasons. One is to smooth over differences. An example that was given was when your wife asked if you find her attractive or if you love her. Oh, yes, dear, I do, because that smooths over the differences. Unbelievable. Second reason is to gain the upper hand over an enemy. In other words, you don't tell the truth to your enemies. You lie to them, especially for those living in a country where Islam exists as a minority. There are several forms also of sanctioned lying, four of them. There's the taqiyya, which is to saying something saying something that isn't true as it relates to Muslim identity, uh, whether, one, uh, whether one is a Muslim or what that means. Uh, and then, of course, uh, that's the Shiite term. The Sunni term is uh, mudarat. There's the kitman, which is lying by omission. Oh, yeah. Take things out of context or take things only in fragments. An example would be when a Muslim apologist quotes only a fragment of a verse. Uh, do you believe in killing others? Oh, no, 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 no. If anyone kills, the Quran says very clearly, it shall be as if he killed all mankind. No, that's a big no-no. Uh-uh. But guess what? There's more to the verse. So saying that while neglecting to mention the rest of the verse, we ordain for the children of Israel that if anyone killed a person not in retaliation of murder or and to spread mischief in the land, it would be as if he killed all mankind. A little different story. Tariya is another way of intentionally creating a false impression by saying something that is technically true when knowing that the listener will interpret it in a different way. And this practice has a broader application than the first one, the takia. And then there's also the maruna, the blending in uh, it, by setting aside some of the practices of Islam or some of the practice of Sharia law. For what purpose? In order to advance others. And we see that time and time again, especially with Muslims. Uh, they start hinting about Sharia and go, oh, no, 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 no. No, 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 we're, 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 we're about uh, following the rule of law. So lying to your enemies is sanctioned, and not only sanctioned, it is encouraged. So let's go back to this end time martyrdom slide that we talked about earlier. So in, we talked about in Revelations, beheaded for the testimony of Jesus, for the word of God. Jesus warned in John 16, whoever kills you will think he's offering a service to God. Matthew 24, 9, where he's talking about they will deliver you to tribulation and put you to death and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake, for being a Christian. And then Revelation 6, 9, the fifth seal. Uh, where we saw under the altar the souls of those who have been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. So, end time persecution. It will have to come from a very anti-Christian and anti-Semitic movement, a movement that hates the Jews, a movement that hates Christians. Does Islam fill that requirement? Yes. Persecution will entail many, many beheadings. Does Islam feel that? Yes. How about a belief that what they're doing is divinely appointed to kill non-believers? Don't tolerate them, kill them, or force them to adopt Islam. And if they don't, then kill them. Does Islam, is that their way? Yes. And well, what about a global conquest, a conqueror bent on conquest. Is Islam considered a global movement by themselves? And as Jesus says, you will be hated by all nations. The answer is emphatically yes. So what's the lesson to be learned here? The lesson to be learned here is that in order to be prepared 
We need to know our enemy. First of all, we need to identify our enemy and we need to know our enemy. Now, ultimately, yes, our enemy is Satan our, uh, and, and our enemy is going to be Satan that is possessing the Antichrist. So it'll be Satan incarnate. But if we're, are we going to look in a Roman direction for enemy or are we going to look at a, an Islamic direction? Very important, distinct differences. Okay. Uh, for anybody that wants to learn more about it, uh, here's some uh, internet resources that will be in the handouts. Also some books that are very good. One is Why I Left Jihad, The Root of Terrorism, The Return of uh, Radical Islam by Walid Shobit. Uh, Middle East Peace, The Scriptural Case for an Islamic Antichrist. And the Islamic Antichrist, The Shocking Truth About the Real Nature of the Beast. Both of these are just eye-opening books, highly recommended written by Joel Richardson. And uh, that pretty much is as far as we're going to go. We don't have time for the sixth seal, but let me just say this, because there's still something, shall we say, a white elephant in the room, something that has not been discussed uh, that we need to look at, and that is suffering for Christians and Jews being sanctioned by God, not only sanctioned by God, but that's part of his plan. Why is that? Is it for punishment? Is it for chastisement? Is it for refining? Is it for purification? Is it for preparing his bride uh, to be without fault? What is it really? Okay. Now, obviously, uh, one of God's purposes in suffering is for the Jewish people that do not acknowledge Yeshua as their Messiah. And he has already said very clearly uh, two-thirds are going to be destroyed, one-third. I'm going to take that one-third, and I'm going to refine them. So even that one-third is going to uh, undergo a very painful process of becoming his people. But what about the saints? What about the church? We're going to discuss that, but not now. Hopefully next week. So we're going to end on that note, and... Um, um, what can I say? More to come and be blessed.